There's been a lot of talk about the uncommitted vote in Michigan on Tuesday's primary, and before the vote, there were reports that the Biden administration was, quote, freaking out about it. But I mean, after 101,000 people voted uncommitted, we've all been pretty curious to hear what they think now, because if they were freaking out before the vote, they've got to be freaking out now. And we finally got a response, and it is genuinely astonishing that this is their response to disillusion voters in Michigan. So campaign co-chair for Biden's 2024 campaign, Mitch Landrew says, quote, we are going to continue to talk to them and then ask them to think about the choices and what the consequences are about electing somebody who wants to have a Muslim ban. In other words, you have no choice but to support Biden in November because you have nowhere else to go. You're not gonna support Trump. We know that. So it's either genocide with Biden or genocide and a Muslim ban with Trump. So shut the fuck up and accept your choices. Amazing. First of all, saying vote for us because the other guy is worse. Not necessarily the most inspiring message. I take it a lot of people aren't going to be motivated to get out and vote affirmatively for Biden. Maybe they will vote against Trump. But that right there. That's not going to mobilize voters. Second of all, they are basically saying implicitly that they're not going to change course, meaning that they are effectively willing to risk losing this election to Trump all to continue to appease Netanyahu. It is so stunning. And I think that this hubris hinges on the fact that they think that the backlash to Biden supporting genocide is just contained to Michigan. But if they actually think that, then they are horribly mistaken because activists in Colorado are organizing an uncommitted vote there too, following the success in Michigan's campaign. And the largest labor union in Washington state has endorsed an uncommitted campaign against Biden there as well. But you know, I'm sure that uh, they don't care because well, Trump's worse, so shut the fuck up and accept my support for genocide or get a Muslim man too. Now, listen to Michigan responded, and this is what they said, quote, it's deeply offensive that President Biden keeps suggesting he has a messaging issue among Arab Americans and young people rather than a funding bombs issue. Biden's reelection chances will be judged by how much of Gaza is left standing by November. It is our hope that Biden chooses the people of America over sending Netanyahu a blank check for war and occupation. Yeah, well, I'm not holding my breath. Now, remember that ceasefire that he said that he was trying to broker when he was in an ice cream shop before the vote took place? Well, he's already throwing cold water on that. And it is specifically because the government he's supporting committed what people are now calling the flower massacre. And in response, he says that that's going to complicate negotiations, which is to be expected. But the fact that they did this flower massacre should be a turning point, you would think. There's been many points where you think, man, maybe this should be a turning point for the Biden administration, bombing hospitals and schools and residential areas and cultural centers. So don't think that the flower massacre is really going to have an impact on him and sway him at all. But nonetheless, this is a pretty big deal as well. Al Jazeera reports more than 100 Palestinians have been killed and some 700 others wounded after Israeli troops opened fire on hundreds waiting for food aid southwest of Gaza City, health officials say, as the besieged enclave faces an unprecedented hunger crisis. People had congregated at Al Rashid Street, where aid trucks carrying flour were believed to be on the way. Al Jazeera verified footage showing the bodies of dozens of killed and wounded Palestinians being carried onto trucks as no ambulances could reach the area. Quote, we went to get flour. The Israeli army shot at us. There are many martyrs on the ground. And until this moment, we are withdrawing them. There is no first aid, said one witness. Reporting from the scene, Al Jazeera's Ishmael Al Ghul said that after opening fire, Israeli tanks advanced and ran over many of the dead and injured bodies. Quote, it is a massacre on top of the starvation threatening citizens in Gaza, he said. They murdered people who were trying to get flour. Now, in response, the IDF accused the Gazans that they murdered of looting the supplies and subsequently released this footage here. I'm not going to play it for you, but there's a screenshot showing that dozens died from uh, what they call overcrowding and trampling. So just stop for a moment and think about how twisted this response is from the IDF. They were implying that they had no choice but to open fire on them because they were trampling each other. So in order to protect people, they had to kill people, specifically more than 100 people. Makes total sense. 
these are the types of genocidal freaks that we're dealing with here. Now, they also accuse them of looting while pretending as if they're not also deliberately starving Palestinians who have been forced to eat grass and drink polluted water just to survive. So, I mean, when one A truck finally is allowed in by Israel, yeah, they were a little bit desperate and they crowded the A truck as any human being who was starving to death would do. But to put things into perspective, I want to play a clip from Melanie Ward of the organization called Medical Aid for Palestinians, because what she says here about what's happening is chilling. Just explain first why viewers, why aid isn't being allowed in? Where is the aid? It's very simple. It's because the Israeli military won't let it in. We could end this starvation tomorrow very simply if they would just let us have access to people there, but, but it's not being allowed. This is what they said on the 7th of October. Nothing will go in and, and so it remains the case. And for people in the north of Gaza, it's even worse because no food is reaching them anymore. And so my own staff, my own colleague, Abir, has been eating animal feed. And horrifyingly, the food that they were eating, which is food for horse and donkeys, is now running out and now they're eating bird seed. The statistics also tell their own story. One in six children under the age of two in the north of Gaza are now acutely malnourished. This is the fastest decline in a population's nutrition status ever recorded. And what that means is that children are being starved at the fastest rate the world has ever seen. And we could finish it tomorrow. We could save them all, but we're not being able to. We're witnessing the fastest decline in a population's nutrition status ever recorded. Again, all of this is purposeful. Israel is choosing to starve Gazans. It is all deliberate. And as they allow aid to trickle in, they then open fire on the population when it gets a little bit too rowdy as they starve to death because of Israel. It's just so sickening. And as this war goes on with how many atrocities that we've seen that are just beyond the pale and indescribable, I don't even know what else to say. The fact that it's gone on this long it makes me lose hope for humanity, that we can all collectively sit back and watch this happen, and there's nothing we can do. It's genuinely despicable and nauseating. Now, Congressman Ro Khanna questioned Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin about Israel's refusal to let aid in, and he asked if there's going to be any consequence at all for all the war crimes they're committing, perhaps maybe cutting off weapons at a minimum. I know, difficult to hear that possibility because we've got to keep giving them weapons to kill innocent Palestinians. But as you're going to see, um, Lloyd Austin had no good response because there won't be any consequences. Let's watch. Cindy McCain, the head of the World Food Program, has said that the Palestinian children are starving. Extremist settler Stomrich, Israel's finance minister, stopped American flour, which our taxpayers paid for to get into Gaza. If Israel, Israel again ever stops American paid aid from getting into Gaza, will you commit to not sending future arms sales? Again, that's, uh, uh, that's not my decision. Uh, I, would, uh, I would, number one, uh, do what I've been doing and engage uh, the leadership and, and encourage them uh, to, to ensure that humanitarian assistance is getting... Mr. Secretary, I would just say, and I have one more question, that you, we need some consequences when another country is defying you, defying the National Security Advisor, defying the President, uh, defying National Security Memorandum 20. Uh, there has to be some consequence. And then I was surprised John Kirby said that Israel is taking more precautions than the U.S. military would to protect civilian life. Mr. Austin... Secretary Austin, isn't that statement inaccurate given Israel has used hundreds of 22,000 pound dumb bombs when there were no place to, for civilians to go? Would the U.S. government ever target terrorists with 2,000 pound bombs in a densely populated area? Well, we, we ha I mean, there, it depends on the, on the situation. And, and again, but would we, have we done that? Put, 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 use 45% of bombs that are unguided or a 2,000 pound bomb? I, I mean, do you really think that the Israeli government is taking, military is taking more precautions than the United States military would? I, I think, uh, you know, just based upon the results uh, in terms of the, uh, the law, the, uh, 
significant loss of life. Gentlemen's time expired. Chair, and now, he was also asked about whether or not weapons to Israel would be cut off since they're using them to commit war crimes and knowingly giving weapons to a state that is using them to commit war crimes is a violation of international law. And of course, Lloyd Austin didn't give a direct answer to that, even though at the start of that exchange, he admitted that Israel has killed more than 25,000 innocent civilians. But it doesn't matter going to keep funding them, going to keep on vetoing ceasefire resolutions on the UN Security Council. It doesn't matter. And they are pretending as if they're oblivious to everything that's going on. They're acting as if they don't have access to the same information that we all have, right? When in actuality, they know more than us. They have more intelligence of us. So if anything, they know how much worse it is on the ground, but yet not going to make any changes. And to make matters even worse, it seems like a ground invasion of Rafah is now imminent, even though the Biden administration has tried to discourage Israel from doing this. But of course, Israel isn't listening because they know that they can do whatever they want. And the Biden administration is still going to continue to support them. And to make matters even worse, the Biden administration is now expressing concerns that a ground invasion of Lebanon is possible. And yet, I still don't hear any possible change in policy towards Israel. This is a rogue state that needs to be sanctioned and cut off from the international community entirely. But we can't even get the U.S. government to agree to stop sending them more weapons that they're using against innocent civilians. What the fuck? It's just so frustrating to see them play dumb and to tell us to shut the fuck up when we criticize Biden over this. If you are somebody who is trying to scold anyone for speaking out against this, shame on you. If you're a Biden supporter, you can vote for him because we all acknowledge that Trump is worse. But if you tell people, don't you dare criticize him, you really need to look in the mirror because maybe you're in a cult just like MAGA supporters. But, you know, apparently you have to let Biden continue to uh, use our tax dollars in perpetuity to support this. Uh, otherwise, you clearly haven't thought through the consequences of electing somebody who wants to have a Muslim ban, right, Mitch Landrew? It's so frustrating, so disheartening to see this. Again, voters are warning him months in advance that they will not vote for him if he continues to do this. They can choose to take that threat seriously or disregard it. It's up to them, right? Nobody can make them do anything. But they don't get to blame voters if they lose in November. They don't get to pin the death of American democracy on voters if Trump wins because Biden has chosen to prioritize Netanyahu's genocide over American democracy. And I'm going to leave you with some wise words from Mehdi Hassan, who explains how foolish Biden is being here by continuously going along with every single thing the Israeli government wants. I also think it's crazy that Joe Biden is willing to wreck his presidency, potentially, and American democracy if Trump gets back in for Benjamin Netanyahu, a man who has basically... I can't find the daytime language for it, done bad things to every Democratic president in my lifetime. Bill Clinton struggled with Netanyahu, Barack Obama struggled with Netanyahu, and now Biden could sacrifice his own presidency. For who? For Bibi?